So welcome everybody, my name is Magic and I work with the eLearning Network at eLearning.net. I'll be discussing today's storyboard and narration script writing. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to visit eLearning.net and download uh, the job bays that we're going to be covering today. They're free, um, free of charge. Uh, just go to the eLearning.net website, go to the ELN store, scroll down to uh, the instructional design job aids area, and then just download the narration script template and the storyboard template. There's other resources in here that may be of interest to you as well, so feel free to download uh, those and anything else you might want. We also have uh, other templates and things that appear for free and low cost, so feel free to browse our uh, shop and uh, get access to any resources that may be of interest to you. So today we're talking about script writing and storyboarding. So we're going to start off with the why storyboard. Uh, if you have any internal resistance to storyboarding, if you yourself are not quite sure what the value and benefit of storyboarding is, we'll be covering that. We'll then segue over into what does a storyboard include, the different elements that are included in the storyboard, and then we'll look at the actual storyboard template and walk through some of the elements to tie it all together. Then we'll shift over to how to prepare a script for a voice talent and take a quick look at the eLearning.net narration script template and walk you through how to use that. So before we begin, just a quick note about the eLearning Network. Uh, we are a free network. Uh, you could join. Membership is free. Uh, we give uh, access to free trainings like this, free job aids and downloads and things. Uh, we also are a full service custom eLearning development shop here. Uh, we're happy to help you with any of your projects at any level, whether you just need a little graphic design support or if you need to outsource a whole project because it's just too busy to take it on. We're happy to chat with you and help you any way that we can. Uh, so feel free to browse our job aids and e-learning templates and see if there's things of value for you up there. And if you need any one-on-one -on -one training, we can also do that for you as well. So let's talk about why storyboarding. If you haven't used a storyboard before, uh, these are some of the key elements and key reasons why you should be doing so. First, the storyboard serves as a blueprint, a production blueprint. It's going to be used by multiple people including instructional designers, content writers, graphic artists, your narrators, the course author who's the person who's going to assemble all these things together in your tool like Storyline or Captivate or Lectora. Multiple people, if they're involved in the process, having a storyboard will keep all these multiple people literally on the same page. Um, and while it may seem that storyboarding takes extra time or adds time to the process or adds complexity, the truth is actually the opposite. Uh, using a storyboard helps you save time and helps you control your costs while also improving the quality of what you do and reducing stress for everybody. And we'll talk about how those things happen and why. Um, but perhaps most importantly, the storyboard helps you really define and crystallize the scope of multimedia work effort that's going to be required. So once, if you have a vision of what you want your e-learning to be, it's a concept. You think you know how long it's going to run, you think you know how many interactivities you're going to have, but before you actually start producing your media and producing your graphics and recording your narration and making your course, if you have it documented in a storyboard, you can verify the actual scope of work that's going to be required to make the course and double check that against what you originally assumed. So let's say, for example, you believe you're making a 30-minute course. Um, if your narration turns out to be about um, uh, you know, 10,000 words, then you'll know that you're going to be way over the 30-minute threshold. Well, how do we know that? Well, if you have all your narration typed up, then you can do a word count on that. And the average speaking rate is about 150 words per minute for voice talents. So if you take your total word count divided by 150 minutes, that'll tell or excuse me, 150 words per minute, that'll tell you about how long your course is going to run. So your storyboard can serve as a baseline sort of measurement to ensure that you're still on track and within scope of what you thought the project would be. Additionally, uh, if you have a storyboard, just as important it is for people to use the storyboard to build your e-learning course, it's important for your uh, approver, uh, whoever is governing the, the, the total time and budget and making signing off on things, um, that person can, if they review and approve the storyboard, then when you're um, 
reviewing the media to make sure that your course is accurate and finished and complete, you're, you can use the storyboard as a way to do QC and to make sure that the course is actually uh, delivering on what you said you would do. So the storyboard is a great way to get it approved at the beginning of the project and then when you finish the e-learning you can use it to measure to make sure that you delivered what the storyboard said. So it's a great for controls uh, to allow provers to sign off at different stages of development. And uh, that sort of talks to the final point here. It, gover it governs, the storyboard governs the media change request and sign off process. Uh, the bottom line is if you have a storyboard and everybody's reviewed it and signed off and agreed to what you're going to create before you create it, when you create then your course and offer it to be signed off for, for approval and final completion, uh, sometimes there are people that want to make changes to the course or they want to request that edits be done. So there's a difference between an edit and a change. A change is anything that you're asked to do to change something that was already signed off. An edit is simply correcting a mistake. So generally speaking you want to make as many edits as you can to make sure that the course is in line with what what your stakeholders are expecting. However changes on the other hand sometimes come out of the blue and being able to distinguish between a change versus an edit is made possible by having a storyboard. And if it's a change for example you could go back to whoever's approved the course for development and who was also asking for now changes and you can have a conversation about whether you need more time or more budget or more anything in order to accommodate those changes because you can verify now that what's being requested was not requested before, it's catching you off guard and it may have implications for time and budget. So it's much easier to have those conversations conversations if you have a storyboard uh, that's backing you. So the typical e-learning production job roles that go into creating an e-learning course, the storyboard is designed to satisfy and help all of these different people or make sure that these different job roles are done properly. Important thing to note on this slide is that while there's multiple different job roles, sometimes one person may perform two or more of these roles. So it's not to say that you'll have a team of all of these people, different people working on your project. Some of you may have people working on your project that are um, multiple people like this. Others may have a single person who is going in and um, doing all of these roles or some combination between there. But the idea is the storyboard serves all of these different aspects. So from the project sponsor, who again is going to approve the storyboard and understand, have a very clear vision of what you envision because they have the storyboard right in front of them telling them exactly what you're going to build. If they sign off on that, then when, at the end of the project they can use and verify that you did what you said you would. Um, subject matter experts can gather their content and stick it into the storyboard that would then be um, massaged and edited by instructional designers and content writers to actually build out the narrative. Uh, the difference between a subject matter expert and a content writer is subject matter experts may be experts in the, not, in the information but not really be trainers or, or writers, but your creative writers can work with these folks to understand what it is they're trying to explain and why and what's the best way to deliver that through an e-learning narration. So um, again, sometimes these are all one person or sometimes they're different people, but the storyboard gives everybody a single location where all of this information can be decided up front. Additionally, as the storyboard will include notes for the graphic artists. Uh, and we'll talk about what kind of notes you can give an artist. Artists that are expert, talented graphic artists in the e-learning world can take just any little bit of information you give them and create beautiful visuals that are better than what you could have imagined. So as long as you give them some general direction, which is the purpose of the storyboard, they'll do fine. Then also your narrator will use the narration part to read the, record the narration and it helps the narrator if they can see the other notes in the storyboard that support the narration. Um, it gives them more context to what they're saying so maybe it'll help them with their delivery. Finally, the, the, once the storyboard is all complete, your e-learning programmer or author will use this storyboard as an assembly instruction, sort of a set of instructions of here's your audio, here's your pictures, here's where things are supposed to be synchronized, and they will just assemble it all rapidly uh, because everything's already pre-built for them. They've got their graphics from the artist, they've got their voice uh, recordings from the narrator, uh, they know exactly in the storyboard uh, where the synchronization points are, that when the uh, narrator says this line, show this graphic, all of that is covered in the, in the um, storyboard. And then finally, once you're done with the media production, you can have an internal QC editor watch and review the course against the storyboard to make sure that everything matches and everything's covered and done properly and make changes or edits as you go along to make sure that the course is finally ready for final approval by the, whoever is the project sponsor. 
So before I continue, let me stop and ask a question. Uh, any questions there from anybody in the group here? Feel free to just throw that into the, uh, the chat window here to me. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So um, let's talk a little bit about the needs by each job role then. We talked about those job roles. What do these people need to know uh, from the storyboard? Well, again, the sponsor is going to want to have confidence that, that the course is within scope and if it's going to be out of scope, they want to be able to justify why you need more time and more money. So these people need to know, what are you going to do? Have confidence that you can do it. And if the plan changes, they want to be able to justify it. So the storyboard helps accomplish that. The subject matter expert needs a way to communicate their content and verify that the course is accurate before it gets built, before the media gets built. So the whole idea of, um, and saving time and money is that if you it's more expensive to re-record audio, recreate graphics, um, if you didn't have information documented correctly in the storyboard, than it is to have it documented up front and then build it. So as long as you start with an accurate set of instructions and you build your media from there, you'll you'll reduce the likelihood that you'll have to have more time and more money to do rework of media. Uh, so the subject matter expert can make sure that they communicate clearly their, their content to you and then verify that the storyboard, whatever you do to take their content and, and to write a narration, that that's still correct and, and going to work. The instructional designer can then um, um, make sure that the course um, learning objectives are covered and also look to the sponsor to get uh, approvals along with the SME approval to make sure that the um, the instructional design content flow and key learning objectives are all in line with what the sponsor and the subject matter expert believes needs to be covered in the course. Um, your authors need some kind of design direction. They need to know what, how to name their files for the person who's going to assemble the course. Uh, they need to get approval from the instructional designer or others to make sure that their artwork that they've supplied is meeting the, what they're expecting and so on. Um, narrator, of course, will need the script, and they'll need to know how do how should they, the whoever's recording the audio, name the files when they give them back to you, so that they you know exactly where they fit into the course. And the script, excuse me, the um, uh, storyboard does that. Then you have the course author who's going to take all these pieces and put them all together. They're going to assemble them. They're going to organize all the source files. They're going to build out and publish the courses and get them reviewed and edit them as needed and so on. Um, your editor is going to need an answer key and sort of some sort of a blueprint that they can review to see if the course is correct or not. Sometimes the editor, the best editors, are reviewing the course for the very first time. Uh, once all the media is done, they maybe were not involved in the storyboard process at all. So you have a fresh set of eyes of somebody who's not at all familiar with the course, going through watching the course, comparing it against the storyboard, and making sure that it makes sense to them and that things are done correctly. And then finally, the e-learning production manager needs a system to track who's doing what and what's ultimately the goal here. What are we all working toward? Uh, so the storyboard satisfies all those needs. So now that we know what's in the storyboard and how it helps all these people, let's take a look at the storyboard in depth. And I'm going to go ahead and just bring open my Word document here. So the storyboard doesn't have to include all these things, but it can. Oftentimes your instructional design documents will include these items, but I'll cover them just briefly here. It's a good idea to include in your storyboard at the very beginning the learning objectives that you have that you want to make sure are covered. And um, so you can just write up you know, the, the learning objective that you have. Uh, you also want to document what the course description should be. Sometimes you want to write the course description after you've already written the storyboard so that way your course description can be a more complete picture. So your course may evolve and change over time as you're writing the storyboard so some of the best descriptions are written once you have you already know what you're going to finally say. Um, the seat time that is based on again the word count so if you have a course that um, has uh, 3,000 words you know it's about 20 minutes because it's about 150 words per minute so you know divide that into um, 3,000 and you come up with 20 minutes so um, if you know going in what you want the seat time to be just document that for your own self and then if it turns out to be longer than that you can again go back to your sponsors and everybody and say uh oh you know the course is twice as big as we thought it would be how are we going to handle that um, the development level it's good to document that too. There's a difference between what we call like a level zero course, which is a rapid e-learning course, versus like a level four, which may be a complex, multi-branching, 
3D graphics, you know, super amazing complex course, um, there's a difference in time and budget that's needed to pull off those two different experiences. So documenting that in here, at least you have it written down that everybody's agreed to this is what you're creating. Um, a little bit about the target audience, just to make sure that the, what you're creating is going to um, be appealing to them, uh, and any other information that you want to have. Um, we have a section in here to have a high-level course outline, so uh, you can create this outline in PowerPoint if you wish. Sometimes people find it a little easier to do that, but you, the point, however you use it, whether it's in Word or PowerPoint or some other tool, create yourself a high-level course flow or outline. Again, you might already have this created in what we call an instructional design document, uh, but if you bring that into your storyboard, then you can use it as a checklist to make sure that everything's been covered. Uh, the photographic shot list here, if you're going to be grabbing assets from all over um, different places and different people, um, you're probably going to want to um, put their file names in here so you can keep everything straight and you know maybe a little bit of an image description and what the file name is presently. And once you get done sketching out your storyboard, you can rename the files, you know, like... Uh, that you save on your hard drives or on your shared network drives to match what you want it to be in your storyboard. So for example, if you get a file that's called Happy Smiling Employees, you might want to document that here as Happy Smiling Employees.jpg and put in a description that it's a couple of people smiling and that it's going to be used in the cover slide. And that's what you would document in here so that um, as you pull all this information, you're kind of documenting what you have. And then you can always rename that slide something like um, 01 for slide 01 dot intro dot and then maybe smiling people or something like that so you can change the file name of the graphic and um, make sure that it's, it makes logical sense so that it's easier for assembly later on so we'll talk about naming conventions a little later but just remember that file naming is very important and you want to document whenever you can um, all the assets that are going in here including um, any videos any audio files and any JPEGs uh, so that if you have to reuse them or edit them later you can quickly identify and find where they are and switch them out um, key terms and trademarks, good idea to uh, just document anything you might want to have in a glossary or if you're supposed to always use a registered trademark symbol next to any kind of a key phrase, um, you want to just make sure you define those things up front here so that everybody knows these are things to pay attention to. So key terms and trademarks or anything else that you want to define uh, in the course, there's a section here for that. So those are just some preliminary things, but this is the meat of the storyboard here. This is where most of your work is going to be performed. So the what we do here at the eLearning Network when we're writing storyboards we like to have a table and row structure like this so um, let's talk about what goes in each of these columns first in the audio file narration this is where you're going to type up your narration so let's say we um, had a bunch of narration in here let's just go ahead and um, just copy and paste some stuff in here so let's say you're putting your narration in here and this is what the voice talent is going to be saying. Um, it's important to have it exactly the way you're going to have your voice talent read it in this section. So the beauty of using something like Word is that you can spell check it, grammar check it, have the subject matter expert verify that it's still technically accurate, and have um, anybody else read through it to make sure that it flows and sounds good. You can also then copy and paste this into the final script for your narrator and it's all documented. But what's more than that is you can match uh, to the narration uh, exactly what's going to be on screen text in terms of the um, what, what kind of bullet points or what kinds of text is going to be supporting the narrative as well as what other graphics and visual instructions you want to have that's going to be synced with the audio. So let's say this is a bunch of text in here that's going to be read. Right now you see this might take, this might be a minute and a half worth of audio. Um, if you wanted to bring in, say, three different graphics over that minute and a half, what you would do is break this down into a couple of rows here. So instead of having one row with all this narration, you would split it up like this, and you would say something like bullet one goes here, bullet two goes here, and then bullet three goes here. So this way, um, whoever's assembling this course can pay attention to the audio, uh, can know exactly that when this narration starts to bring, fade in this bullet, when this next part of the audio starts to play, fade in this bullet. 
You could also, on the visual instruction side here, say, uh, show uh, happy, smiling employees photo. And then uh, you, over here, you could say, fade to corporate logo. And maybe the third point is going to be um, something like um, show uh, corporate office. So let's say the narration, that these visuals support what's being said in the file narration. Uh, whoever's going to assemble this course knows, and the subject matter, everybody knows. The sponsor, the graphic artist, whoever's going to put this thing together, they all know this is what's going to be said, this is what's going to show on the screen, this is the photo that we need, and there's no mistake, no ambiguity. The page title here, this could be something like um, uh, welcome. This should be the name of the slide as it would show in a table of contents. Maybe you'll have it on the header of the page of your e-learning, um, but this is something that should be descriptive of what this page is, is doing. And then the page number here is simply, this would be um, maybe slide 01. And um, other things that we might want to have in here, um, you probably are going to put the slide one this title. You want to do these slides after your storyboard is roughed in. Do all the file naming conventions and everything at the very end. Um, so, for example, then let's say this is the end of here of this section, and you're going to have a new section start. This would be slide o two, and maybe this is learning objectives. And then over here, visual instruction is uh, you could say something like uh, fade in the bullets as spoken. Um, by the narrator and also uh, show accompanying icons and then you might have something like um, you know objective one here is what the, whatever the bullet's going to be and then you have your text and so everything's lining up here's my text I'm going to fade in this bullet this is my general instructions I know I'm going to have accompanying icons are going to need to be um, created. If these icons don't already exist, you could say uh, create and show accompanying icons and you can describe them. For the first objective, maybe it's a hard hat. For the second objective, maybe it's a, um, a safety goggles. You know, whatever it is that you want to have visually represented in here, the graphic artists will now use these instructions to create these icons. And you can go uh, a step further and say I want this to be um, called uh, hard hat dot jpeg and I want this to be goggles dot jpeg and then once you're all done with your um, slide naming and conventions and so on you can say I want this to be now I'm going to make the final name of this um, o2 dot o2a dot hard hat o2b dot goggles so you see what's happening here now when you get ready to assemble this course you can take the audio, copy and paste this um, on-screen text into the um, e-learning course, find from your graphic artist uh, in a, probably one file called graphics, nicely sequentially ordered, zero through however many it goes, and they're all roughly in the order in which they'll go into the course. You can know exactly that this hardhat.jpg goes exactly in this spot. And um, over here, you could also say, uh, that you're going to use the audio is going to be called um, maybe it's um, o2 dot um, learning objectives dot mp3 so that's the kind of thing that helps you understand all right this audio is going to match with these graphics and they're going to go into this slide number two and everything is blueprinted out in a way that anybody can understand so that is uh, the purpose of um, the, the main elements of the storyboard here. Uh, so referring back to my notes over here, uh, there's a couple other points I want to mention. I've already discussed that the average speaking rate is about 150 words per minute. So avoid having more than 225 or 300 words in a single screen. So this, this would be one screen here because notice we only have, you know, we don't have... Um, we only have this one title up here. And uh, so you don't want more than maybe a minute or two of narration in any given screen. To aid in the timing of the graphic animations, again, break them down into rows as you see here. 
Uh, you can also, if you have multiple bullets in here in one row and you want to have the narration over here, instead of having for every new row every time you want something to change, use some asterisks or use something to denote a synchronization point or a sync point. Wherever there's an asterisk, move on to the next item. And the, the course person who's assembling the course will know, okay, I'm going to just follow along and I'm, I know exactly at that point I'm going to show the bullet or item that, that matches the text, that matches that audio. So just instructions to make sure they know how to put it together. Uh, and also if you notice, if you are using this asterisk concept, if you have asterisks right next to each other in a sentence, you'll know that that's going to be kind of rushing in graphics. So you might want to rethink about how is it that you um, create, uh, how is it that your sentences are structured so you give more time for your visuals to, to reveal and remove from the screen. Finally, um, uh, when it comes to the media text here, you want to uh, list the on-screen text in the exact format that you want it to appear on the screen. So for example, if you're going to have a bullet header above a bullet list, say maybe it says learning objectives colon, and you have bullet lists are going to say, maybe you have a little line that says in this course you're going to learn dot dot dot, and then you have a bullet list of the things you're going to learn. Some clients want to have it so that it's no capitalization at the beginning and no and then maybe final punctuation at the end of each of those lines so it's a completing a sentence so they want it to appear as if each of those bullet lines is the completion of a sentence including with the proper punctuation if you have that level of specificity that you want included in your courses that level of consistency and quality then you need to document it here in the storyboard and make sure that everybody's understands what those standards are so that when if it's all done and documented correctly in the storyboard all you have to do is copy and paste it into storyline or captivator again your favorite tool and you know there's no guesswork for whoever is developing the course finally and so it gives a great way to before you build out your course to make sure that everybody's conforming to all the various rules and regulations that are at your organization and um, you can also, because it's in a storyboard format, it's easier to spell check it and quality check it in something like a word processor than it is to actually try to do that kind of spell checking in your authoring tool. Because the authoring tools, while they may have spell check, generally speaking, the spell checks are not as powerful as they are in word processors that have been around for decades. So, uh, and it's also easier to um, share an e-learning, uh, excuse me, a word document like this among multiple approvers than it is to just, you know, put it all into an e-learning course and hope it's correct and then have to try to find okay where in this course did I forget to put a period uh, it's easier to just scan through a word document than have to watch a bunch of screens and try to hunt and find any mistakes um, for the visual notes here uh, some best best practices here um, if you sometimes if you want to create a graphic and you're not exactly sure um, how to communicate it, you can just rough it in in PowerPoint, you know, uh, make a stick figure or blocks and say over here I want a picture of this and over here I want a picture of that and just sort of outline it the best you can and just rough it in and generally and in whatever tool you want, uh, PowerPoint or you can even hand draw some things and scan them and, and copy and paste them into this section here as a, as a thumbnail. Whatever you can do to describe in your vision of what you want the course to look like, you want to include in this column. Uh, so yeah, again, consider putting thumbnails and screenshots in here. If it's an activity, um, write whatever kinds of visual and programming notes you can think of to help the programmers and the artists understand what you're envisioning here and help you um, refine your ideas in the storyboard level before they go to all the trouble of programming it out. And again, we have you know the file names, audio file names, and image file names uh, that you want to include in your in your storyboard, and uh, any screen details. Uh, so before I continue on, that's, uh, those are the core elements within the storyboard. Uh, any questions from the group, feel free to just type them in here into the um, chat window. I'll give you a few moments to, to type any questions that you may have. And also, please let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Um, how, let me know about the pacing, how you're finding the pacing to go. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on. Oh. Great, thank you, Matthew, for the feedback. I appreciate that. Uh, so when it comes to uh, quiz elements, we want to make sure that we include the question text of any questions that you're going to include in your quizzes. Um, if it's a multiple choice question, you want to list your um, the, what the correct answers are and plus any distractors you may have. Um, you also want, if you are going to include feedback, like correct and incorrect feedback, uh, information that will be presented to the learner, um, 
based on whether they got the question right or not. Um, you want to have all that in the Word document, again, because you can spell check it, make sure from your subject matter experts that they're done correctly. Um, you can also document things like, should you randomize the uh, test questions? Um, if yes, then uh, make sure that you don't use randomize the choices on the test question uh, with for an all of the above kind, because um, some authoring tools don't allow you to anchor the all of the above choice to the bottom. So if you randomize the options for an all uh, multiple choice kind uh, that has an all of the above, all of the above may be choice B, and there may be answers below it. So just be careful for that. And you can also do things like um, whatever it is that your authoring tool you're using, whatever features it allows you to use. If you document those kinds of features in the storyboard, you can get other stakeholders and deciders to say, yes, I, I, well, thank you, I now know what my options are, and I choose option A uh, for to not randomize or to uh, weight the questions or whatever the features are. You want to let the non-e-learning developers know the options they have to choose from and then uh, make sure that they you gather their input and that you do those things. Because odds are, if you can do something one way and you do it that way, but it has an alternate way that it can be another choice that can be made, your stakeholders are going to want that other choice and you're going to have to go in and, and fix it because you know you didn't ask. So error on the side of making sure that you communicate what the options are and that you get instruction and that you follow through on that. That'll just make the project go much smoother and quicker for everybody. So to summarize, uh, the paraphrase, the Lord of the Rings, the storyboard is the one thing that rules them all. Um, the project sponsor or anyone whose opinion matters when it comes to the money and the time that you need to make these courses must sign off on the storyboard before the media production starts. Um, a little caveat to that is not to say that you have to have the entire storyboard signed off before you do any media. You could do some rapid e-learning development and just break the storyboard into sections, like four sections, and then get the first section signed off or the second signed off, or get each page signed off as you go. The idea is just make sure you're documenting what you're going to do before you do it. And that way you can prove that you did what you said you would and then everybody agreed uh, that uh, what was going to be made. So. Um, the purpose of the course review uh, sign-off process then of a when you're using a storyboard, the whole purpose is uh, of the review sign-off process is to verify that the course matches what the storyboard said you would do. If the people who are ultimately responsible for signing off on the story on the final course for you um, think that that's an opportunity for now that they see the course to just go ahead and start making a bunch of changes, they need to be informed that while that may be possible, uh, that you may also require additional time and budget because the, if you explain to them at the beginning of the process that their role is simply to verify that the course matches for course version 1.0, that the course matches what the storyboard said it would do, then keep the focus on that and any changes that they want can be done for version 1.5 and that you may need to get additional time and budget to do that so just be sure you're clear to them at the beginning that their role is simply to sign off on the storyboard and then verify that you did what you said and the the media review time is not just a time to just have a free-for-all ask for whatever changes you want um, because you really should just verify that you did a good job doing what you were told to do at the beginning close that chapter and then move on now to revising the course based on changes that are requested uh, number three, if it's incorrect in the storyboard and you want it corrected in the finished course, that's a change request and may request addition, you may require additional time and money. So if there's something that they wanted that's not in the storyboard or something they asked for that, that now they don't want, those things can be addressed outside of, okay, let's first review and verify and sign off that yes, we did what you said originally and then go back to that. And then finally, four, if it's not in the storyboard and you want to add it to the course, same thing applies. So if it's in the storyboard, it's going to be made. If it's not in the storyboard, it's not going to be done. So as long as everybody understands that from the beginning to end, uh, everybody will be on the same page and you'll find these jobs go a lot smoother for everybody. So that's the storyboard. Once the storyboard is done, it's uh, time to prepare the script for the voice talent. Um, what we like to do with the scripts is um, a little bit different than what we do in the storyboard. It, the, the voice talent doesn't really need all the details that's in the storyboard and it's also kind of hard to read um, especially if you have a bunch of asterisks and things in the narration in the storyboard. So it's best to just make a nice clean script that they can read through naturally and deliver quickly and high quality the audio that you need. 
So a couple of general rules of thumb about the voice talent script. It's a separate document from the Word document, and I've got a template I'll walk you through here in a second. Um, what you want to make sure you include in there is you tell the voice talent the exact file names you want for the audio track. Don't let them just make whatever audio file names they want. Tell them what you want to name them so you can know exactly where they're going to stick into your course because the voice talent doesn't know. And they may give you a bunch of files back that have no, no sort of sequence or rhyme or reason. In the worst case is you have to listen to each track and go back to your storyboard and find out where is it and how, where does it go. Avoid that by telling them up front what the file name should be. The narration structure, the only thing um, that you want to include are the words to be spoken by the talent. If you have any notes, any inflection points, any bullets or numbers or anything like that, anything you don't want them to say, pull it out of the narration section. There's another section for that. And also you want to have at least 1.5 line spacing, 12 point minimum font, and generally the rule of thumb is the industry standard is use the courier font. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but all the voice talents that I've talked to say that's the standard, so that's what we do. There's another column for narration instructions. That's where you put your pronunciation guides. And the key thing is to note, if it can be read wrong, it will be read wrong. If you put a dash in the e-learning, tell them, read it as dash or hyphen or don't read it at all. Like nobody really says e-learning or e-hyphen learning. Many people will spell e-learning with a dash. And if they do so and the voice talent sees the dash, they need to know, skip it. Uh, also, make sure that if you have any acronyms, are they supposed to spell them out, or do they? Is there a special way that they're said as a word? Um, all of those kinds of things. You want to make sure if it can be read wrong, it will be read wrong. So be sure that you call those things out. And you also want to let them know the tone and the speed. Do you want them to be happy and upbeat? Do you want them to be slow and serious and methodical? You know. Um, do you want like a comical kind of a voice? You know, what is it that you're looking for? Help them understand the tone and the speed of pace that you want to have them go through. And when you're working with a voice talent, um, when you're trying to figure out who's going to be the voice for your course, first of all, do you want a male or a female talent? Do you want a younger or older talent? Uh, how should they sound, actually? It's not really so much how old they really are, it's how old do they sound. And... Um, What's the level of quality audio that you require? Do you want a WAV file? Do you want an MP3 file? Uh, do you want to have you know certain you know uh, CD quality or HD quality audio? Um, you know what's the what's the general type of you know technical file that you're looking for? And um, again, we talked a little bit about the delivery style. What kind of inflection and emotion do you want? Uh, and then also just make sure that when you're looking for the talents that are available to you, then are they available on your schedule? Um, make sure you get a sample read that's based on your requirements. Have them read, I'd say, you know, 30 seconds is usually good enough. And then make sure that your sponsor listens to and signs off on the talent before you read it. Because I've had this happen before where, um, you know, a voice talent was not vetted by the client. The client says, I don't like that voice. And now all of a sudden you have to go to another voice talent and record a whole other, you know, section. And the worst case than that, which doesn't really happen here, is if you actually built out and synchronized everything and then they say they don't like the voice, then you're really in trouble. So, because then you have to go through all the process of re recording the audio and re syncing everything. So, be sure that you get final sign off by whoever's going to sign off on the voice talent before you record and go to the studio. Then um, you can also many times uh, listen into the studio through a patch call or, or you know dial in while the voice talent's reading uh, and listen to them as they're delivering the pace and they can check in with you and say how's this sounding did I get it all nailed right okay and so on so if you do have that ability that access to the voice talent you can listen to and coach them along um, you can also um, review the audio that sample that they gave and coach them to say maybe give me another sample that's maybe a little more like X and get them to do samples until you're satisfied that they've got it and that they understand what your visions are. And I put here, you know, cut your losses soon rather than put them through tons of reads. Um, you know, if 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 it's looking like after two or three times that you they're just not getting it, just move on, just try to find another voice talent because, you know, um, you shouldn't strive for perfection for anything that you're doing, but it seems like sometimes people tend to be really picky about the voices. So, um, you know, try to be practical, but at the same time, get what you want. And, um, try to make those decisions quickly. Uh, and then before you include the audio in your project, be sure that you kind of spot review all the audio that the client, that the um, talent submitted just to make sure that it doesn't sound like they made a bunch of mistakes. And we actually did have a voice talent recently that, um, uh, we used for the first time the client liked their voice. So we went with them and 
they just misread words left and right. It was almost as if they were never had done this type of work before, or maybe slightly dyslexic or something. I'm not exactly sure what the problem was, but uh, there was littered with mistakes. And so uh, we quickly switched to a different voice talent after trying a couple more times to get this talent to, to, to be more quality out of the gate. And, um, you know, so just a word of caution, be sure to evaluate your audio before you just stick it all into your course project because, uh, you know, you can't have tons of mistakes in your audio. So then let's take a look at what's actually in this in script template. Very simple. You have your file names in one column. So you expect your voice talent to give you back files named exactly as you put here. You have, uh, th this is actually 1.5 spacing. As you can see, there's a little bit of space between these, uh, these lines. This is also 12 point courier. And uh, so our template actually is already set up with the right font and the right spacing and everything. So you can just delete the text that's in here and start putting your own information. Um, you want to have each uh, bit of narration separated into its own row uh, so that the client, the voice talent can easily see that this is where they're going to read this and stop recording and then record, save the file name and then start the next section. Uh, you also have a special notes column here and this is where you put all your information about in special instructions like pronunciation or emphasis or inflection or um, acronyms or anything else that you want to include. They want to make sure that they read the certain way. And uh, also, if you use a numbered list in the formatting of your narration, um, generally we will not read those numbers. So if you have a numbered list, like you say, we're going to cover these five things, and it says one, two, three, four, five, and you left your numbering in there, unless you spell out, you know, one, we're going to talk about X, you know, two, we're going to do this, um, we're going to skip the numbers and assume you don't want those read. Um, that's because it's, sometimes it sounds kind of odd too, like, Normally, you wouldn't say one, two, three. You'd say first, second, third, and finally, something like that. So um, if you want us to read numbers or, you know, again, if it can be misunderstood, it will be. So just be sure you're clear on how you want numbers and other kinds of things read through. Um, so that's pretty much it for the narration script template. I actually have, I think, a version here. Yeah, so this is what ours looks like. If you were to, we do offer voice talents here. So if you go to elearning.net and you want to use our voice talents and want to use our script, you can send us the script and we'll gladly record it for you. Uh, we have some general notes about, um, um, you know, the kinds of, you know, making sure it's readable and uh, any special instructions and everything we just sort of talked about is covered here in, at the top. And then it goes on here to the actual um, structure. So whether you use us for your voice talents or not doesn't matter. This template is free for you to use and send it to whomever you wish. Uh, that pretty much concludes the um, storyboarding and script writing course. I'm going to post this up online uh, for the attendees here, and I'll send out a link to everybody um, probably tomorrow so you can review this at your leisure or invite other people who may benefit from this kind of information, other people on your team or stakeholders or subject matter experts or any of those other roles that are involved in the process for you uh, can learn more about how this all works and you as a team can come up with a strategy of how to incorporate these kinds of concepts into your workflow. Um, the idea is not that you have to use these processes literally exactly as I've described them, but this is a jumping off point where you can use the template and these ideas and these concepts to come up with your own best method based on your own um, people and way of doing things and your own experiences. So I hope you found this information of value and thank you for your time.